Welcome and thank you all for joining us today for our online session in response to the COVID-19 crisis. My name is Wendy Osborne and I'm a member of the IAVI Secretariat team. We hope all of you are safe and well during these uncertain and challenging times. As the coronavirus pandemic continues affecting our world, IAVI is committed to help volunteers and volunteer organisations deal with the challenges it presents. We have prepared a series of webinars and resources to help you best respond to this crisis. And to learn more about it, please visit um, our iavi.org slash COVID-19 uh, website. We strive to build an inclusive network. So the AVI network is open to individuals and organizations of all capacities and resources. And again, I would encourage you to look at the AVI website to think about becoming a member, uh, to learn more about us and to follow us on social media. And you'll see the links on the screen now. Today's webinar is very much about dealing with a crisis situation. In the event of a disaster or emergency, volunteers are often needed to provide practical and emotional support as the aid victims support the delivery of government and public services and help rebuild communities. And volunteer management is key to achieving the effective involvement of volunteers. So what does good volunteer management in a crisis look like? What has happened in relation to volunteering and COVID-19? In our session today, Denise Hayward, CEO of Volunteer Now in Northern Ireland, and Sarah Henderson, Resilience Advisor for Voluntary Service Overseas, will share a wealth of information and experience on how to involve volunteers in emergency situations, delivering effective volunteer management in a crisis. There's a couple of uh, important announcements as we start. This webinar is being recorded and will be available in our COVID-19 response website following this session. I'm sure you will have questions as we go along, so please type them in the question box and our moderator will convey them to our presenter. We really do want to engage with you in this session and we really want to hear your questions and help you uh, use the panelists to answer some of your queries. Let me start by introducing our moderator for today's session, May Cobb. May Cobb leads volunteer engagement at United Way Worldwide. I met May personally a very, num very many number of years ago now, and she's had a lifetime's experience of working in the volunteering field, has tremendous experience and expertise uh, globally. And actually she currently serves as co-chair of the Volunteer Groups Alliance, a global coalition of volunteer organizations at the United Nations that promote and amplify the role of volunteers in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. She's also an advisor to the UN Disaster and Risk Reduction Programme and a national representative for the national voluntary organisations Active in Disaster group serving on the Volunteer Management Committee. So she has a wealth of experience and is a very able moderator for today's interesting session. So thank you, May, and welcome everyone. Thanks everybody, and Wendy in particular for the kind introduction. We're so glad to have everybody um, participating today and you're really going to enjoy hearing from uh, Denise and Sarah um, in just a moment. I just wanted to go through the agenda just to, so you can follow along of how we're gonna um, handle today's session. I'm gonna share a little bit um, and set the stage and then we're gonna go right into um, uh, presentations that Denise has prepared and Sarah has prepared as well. Um, following that, we'll have some time for Q&A. Um, but if you think of questions as you go along, just as Wendy mentioned, please go into the question um, drop down menu um, in the in the meeting uh, section I think it's on the top right part of your screen if it's the same as mine and just click there and type a message because um, I don't want you to forget any questions that you might have um, and then we'll make sure that we address that um, um, when when we conclude with the presentations and then uh, Wendy will wrap us up at the very end um, after our Q&A time together.
So let me start, um, and I thought it would be fun to share this quote, which I think is sort of uh, a, a great piece of advice. Benjamin Franklin saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I think one of the things all of us that are involved in um, disasters and, and uh, crisis and um, emergency response um, know that having and creating a culture of preparedness is really, really important. And I think in part what we're doing today by sharing um, effective practices and tips um, that folks are utilizing is doing just that. We want to learn um, from each other's experiences um, and particularly during such an unprecedented time um, in dealing with the pandemic um, throughout the world um, and what what we can um, uh, do as a result of that. So I, what I wanted to do, and as Wendy mentioned, I am involved with the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disasters, or NVOAD as it's called in the United States. Um, and I thought it would be helpful to see um, some of the rights and responsibilities that they've organized for volunteers um, during times of disaster. But I thought all of these um, are great um, elements that we ought to be considering. Um, and there's a lot of information and detail um, in, in, around each of these areas that um, can be found on the NVOAD site. Um, I'm sure you'll be hearing um, elements um, of this from each of our presenters today as they talk about um, their effective management practices um, and engaging volunteers during times of crisis. Um, the, the next um, piece I wanted to share with you as well are some very specific lessons um, that came out of the COVID-19 um, crisis, the pandemic. And so these are pieces that um, the stakeholder engagement mechanism mechanism for um, the UNDRR, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, has just put together. So this is um, really hot off the press, so to speak. Um, and I, these I just wanted to really emphasize that people were looking at how to create a preventive approach as we build back better, um, a really a commitment to protect the most vulnerable. So as we are doing um, our, our work and as we're engaging volunteers and focusing on this, how are we really thinking about those that are most vulnerable? Um, because while COVID-19 is impacting all of us, it's certainly not impacting all of us in the same way. Um, and so I thought that would be an important piece. Uh, the multilateralism um, with long-term vision, human rights and so forth. Um, providing messaging um, that's consistent um, and that's framed around the medical and health issues that exist, particularly because of so much misinformation and misinformation that could be shared so quickly through social media and the like. Um, and finally, encouraging individual action um, that not only um, through established volunteer programs and initiatives, but it was one of these things where people were compelled individually to take action, to care for their neighbor, to check in on and, and provide assistance where they could. Um, and so wanting to do that with health and safety guidance and measures such as that. And now I think it's even more important as it's become more confusing in many ways as people are in different states of reopening and different states of um, uh, guidance and instruction that's being followed and, and who's you know, wearing protective uh, gear, who is um, doing the physical distancing, um, what's required you know, outside, what's required inside and so forth. So um, it is confusing and, and we wanna make sure the health and safety guide, um, guidance is, is at the forefront for everyone. All right, well now I'd like to um, uh, introduce um, the two speakers that will be hearing from today and um, getting information from both of them. You heard briefly already um, at Wendy's introduction of Denise. Um, she is the chief executive um, at Valentia Now in, in Northern Ireland. And Sarah then will follow um, and she is with VSO. And while um, she had been in Mozambique um, and based out of Tanzania most recently because of the pandemic, she's actually back in um, in Northern Ireland. So it's it wasn't anticipated that both would be um, in Northern Ireland today, but um, but they are, and we're delighted to have them uh, joining us and sharing their um, terrific perspectives um, and experience with, with us today. So let me turn it over then to Denise, 
Um, and again, a reminder to everyone, if you have questions that emerge as you go along, please don't hesitate to put those into um, the question box. Thanks so much. Thank you, May. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, I'm, as uh, May and Wendy have said, Chief Executive of Volunteer Now. Volunteer Now is a regional support organisation for volunteering in Northern Ireland, and we've been working very closely with government throughout the pandemic to assist them with um, coordination and particularly around guidance and good practice in relation to, to volunteering. So my first slide looks at the definition of volunteering, and I suppose I wanted just to start by reflecting on what we're talking about, because the values piece is really important in the way that we involve volunteers and so an understanding of what we mean <clears throat> and what we are talking about is, is important. So it is that free will, that, that giving of time and as um, May has mentioned, we too in Northern Ireland have seen a massive upsurge in the number of people who have come forward during the pandemic and uh, so for, with that in mind, I just wanted to reflect on the, the values piece to start with. If you can put my next slide up, um, please. The, the process of volunteer management in times of crisis is, is similar but not the same, I think, to the process of volunteer management every day of the week. Um, so you're seeing a relationship there between individuals who are giving their time to an organisation or sometimes to a mutual aid group or just as a, a, a person, an individual, but you're also um, seeing an expectation, particularly in that in, uh, organisational setting, of having clear role descriptions, um, good management in, in place, training, insurance, safeguarding, all of those things that are important. Um, and the focus of my presentation today will be looking at that organisational relationship. However, I will spend some time just at the very end looking at the mutual aid um, piece. I suppose I would, I would say that volunteers, like at any other time, are bringing their enthusiasm, their energy, their experience, their skills to the situation. And, uh, and we want to make sure they're well looked after and well supported. However, you can see that uh, there are huge challenges in terms of the immediacy sometimes of activities needing to happen, the lack of information um, e and, the, and the misinformation, as May has mentioned, in terms of social media, problems in terms of co coordination and communication, and then the stress that often results and, and not having sufficient resources. So you're trying to do all of the good practice in volunteer management against a backdrop sometimes of a bit of chaos. So it's, it's just bearing that in mind. And I suppose my, my next slide then shows the um, kind of I suppose what I would call the ingredients for success. And I think May is absolutely right. Planning is key and um, having that plan for how you're going to manage that spontaneous volunteers. I mean, in our case, we had nearly 5000 people sign up in the space of two, two weeks, um, three weeks. And it was it was just overwhelming. And so, you know, having a plan for how you're going to deal with that is, is really important. Putting in, clear, in place a clear structure, um, so you know, who is responsible um, and how you're linking those immediate volunteers into that kind of local delivery structure. Those kinds of things are really important. And it's better to have those planned in advance um, than, than try and put them in place during the, the, the emergency itself. Clear, simple messages for people who want to help, you know, clear ideas about what they're going to be asked to do, clear messages about timeframes. If you can't immediately involve people, clear messages about how long that will be and the, the process they will have to go through. Having in place a clear structure as well for the key people that they will be there um, providing support. That That's also really, really important. And that's right the way through from a kind of regional overview, right the way through to local um, organisations and their processes. I would also say having a good IT platform in place is very important because um, it allows you to uh, you know, record your tasks, record information about volunteers, uh, and also then provide evidence afterwards because um, even now, you know, we are already being asked for impact statements and having that kind of recording mechanism in place is really important. And finally, you cannot forget and, and you cannot overestimate the importance of good governance and insurance. I know in the media see of things, sometimes those things get pushed to one side and forgotten, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't forget them. I'm going to then just spend a bit of time looking at a few key parts of, of each of these um, sections and uh, I've got a, a mixture of kind of examples of practical things that we've used just to share and, and but please remember that they're being done in the UK legislative context. Um, so in terms of registration 
clearly a process is needed. Um, you know, you need to know who's volunteering because that you will need to make sure they're safe and you will need to be able to keep in touch with those people regularly and you will also need to be able to look after them afterwards. So it is important you know who's there um, and that you have staff or volunteers in place to support that process. It's also important to make sure that you put the necessary checks in place in relation to safeguarding and to keep adults and children safe throughout the process. Uh, we, we talk about GDPR in the UK, which means data protection. It means you can't suspend anybody's um, rights to have their data looked after, even in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and also you need to have a uh, registration process in place to allow you to look after your volunteers um, and to keep them safe during the, the crisis and, and afterwards. So the next slide just shows a um, template. Um, I'm not going to spend any time going through it, but it's it's just there. It's in the presentation. It'll be shared afterwards. And it just gives some idea of a basic registration form that we have used and that might be of value to other people. The next uh, piece I would like to talk about is role descriptions. And uh, sometimes I think people rush on to doing uh, very quickly. I, I would just emphasize the importance of spending a little bit of time thinking clearly about what your volunteers are going to be doing. So the kinds of things that we have seen as being very important through the pandemic in Northern Ireland are uh, volunteers to do shopping for people who are, are staying at home shielding, volunteers providing pharmacy delivery and collecting prescriptions, online support um, and telephone befriending has become essential uh, food delivery we've seen a lot of care for pets for people who are not allowed to go outside and then things like activities online um, just to, to kind of keep people uh, in, involved and engaged so there's been a whole variety of different um, roles but what we would suggest is that it's really important to have a, a clear written role description um, and even when it, it's a, an emergency situation because that makes sure that everybody knows what's expected and everybody's clear about what's expected it also really helps you when you're coming to do your risk assessment i'll go on to talk about that in a wee bit more detail in a moment but that that really helps you to see whether uh, personal protective equipment is going to be needed and what that would be for um, and it also helps you to train your volunteers and give them clear information about what your expectations are so for example our role descriptions for shopping um we're, we're very clear in, in, in helping people to see that they didn't actually go into the person's house and, and those kinds of things. Um, so I've put links into the presentation about some of the templates that we've used and you'll see on the next slide then um, just a, a template specification um, for the shopping support volunteer that, uh, during the COVID pandemic. So again that's available um, for you to see afterwards and to use um, and adapt to suit yourselves. As I said, I, I'm going to talk now about risk assessment. Um, and I suppose it's just that mantra of do no harm, you know, and that's really important in times of emergencies as it is at any other time. And so you, you really need to think about not putting your volunteers or your service users at risk, um, particularly at the moment. I was very concerned in the early part of the pandemic in Northern Ireland that we were seeing such a groundswell of people trying to help other people. Um, and I heard frightening stories about the kinds of activities that were going on. Actually, there was a big risk, I think, initially that people in their willingness to do good were actually potentially spreading the virus even more. So there, there was a real need to draw back from that and, and set some really clear parameters. Um, Risk is, is different in each organisation. Obviously, every organisation has to look at its own context and its own um, situation. We have created a basic template, which again is linked into this and um, is, is going to be shared. Yes, there it is. Um, and, and that will allow you just to make some, some little um, assessments and, and, and thinking about what you should be thinking about in planning for managing risk. You also need to really clearly check with your insurance company if you have insurance in place and, and to see where the parameters of that goes. So don't forget the basics of good volunteer management, even in the throes of, um, of delivering in an emergency context. Also, I think it's important, and I think May mentioned the issue around vulnerability. And I think it's important just to think as well, you know, in your response, are you actually um, creating vulnerability? Are you are you making people who, who normally could be quite resilient and cope for themselves feel vulnerable? And so I suppose it's again thinking about the kinds of roles that are being developed. And, and also then now we're um, navigating our way through that exit process. And that can also be very tricky um, because sometimes in, in your willingness to help initially, you may maybe have stepped a bit beyond what, what you probably should have maybe been doing. So it's worth thinking about. 
about that. My next slides really, the next three slides are really focused on safeguarding. Um, we have a very clear safeguarding framework in place in Northern Ireland in terms of legislation. I'm not sure what that is in other countries, but I suppose for us, it's it's just constantly having at the forefront of our minds that um, in putting volunteers, we have to safeguard the people that they're there to help. For that reason, they may have to have police record checks. They also should be clear about what the code of behaviour is and what we expect from them. And so for that reason, we would put in place a training, um, even a very short training practice just a training pack just to make sure people know what to do. Um, my next slide really refers to um, some temporary guidelines. We did draft some short uh, temporary guidelines and there's information on that link to just kind of uh, help people navigate that landscape who weren't used to it in the very first few days of the pandemic. We saw organisations that wouldn't normally work in a space where they had safeguarding as at the core of their, their work then suddenly leaping into this and so therefore it was important to make sure that they had information. We were suggesting that they would get volunteers to just be aware of the guidelines and sign a copy to make sure that they knew that they'd seen them. One of the key things I think we learned as well was that it wasn't enough just to say you know this is um, this is a good practice, but you needed to make sure volunteers knew what to do if they came across an issue, because often that was something that we saw and organisations needed to have that structure in place to report concerns. Um, my final safeguarding slide there is just a link to some online safeguarding training. Again, it's Northern Ireland context and legislation, but if it's helpful to anyone, it's there and you can uh, book through the link that's there. Um, my next slide really then looks at um, you know, what volunteers' expectations can be, and it's picking up a bit on what May was saying earlier on. Um, so the, the volunteers should expect safe volunteering conditions, even in an emergency situation. And if you're an organisation tasking volunteers and sending them out onto the, the response, you need to make sure that you're looking after them, that they are safe. They need to have regular breaks, they need to rest. Um, they need to have volunteer expenses if possible. They need to have someone to go to for support during the time. And they also need to have support afterwards because sometimes the um, throes of an emergency can be very traumatic and people need to know who to look to for support. And again, we've put some information and some guidance in there. Um, we have seen a real ups upsurge in um, mental health challenges uh, for volunteers because people were sometimes doing helplines and things like that, which they hadn't really got uh, proper training for and what we were noticing really was that there's a great deal of stress and people were um, coping with the very upset people on the end of the phone and um, it wasn't always very easy so I know a lot of resources have now been made available um, and there are a lot of resources for support for people who are helping. My next slide then um, is just in relation to the mutual aid groups that we have seen. Across the UK, there have literally been thousands of new groups that have just sprung up. Um, and we've really seen an upswirge of, of informal volunteering and that individual acts of kindness, which I think have been fantastic to see and have really encouraged me uh, in relation to the number of people who've been involved. Um, well, I suppose our kind of good practice rule of thumb is just to say small is beautiful in terms of mutual aid. In our sort of legal context, once groups grow beyond 50, that personal relationship is gone. And so therefore you do need to see a lot more in terms of that um, coordination and the structure um, that you would see in a normal organisation. I mean, having that range of mutual aid response has led to difficulties in terms of coordination and communication. And there has been duplication of effort and undoubtedly um, we all need to think differently and, and maybe learn um, new lessons about how to respond. There are challenges in relation to governance. I mean, that's not to say that mutual aid organisations aren't managing risk, because I think in many ways they are, but there isn't that um, overarching accountability structure that you would see with a, a sort of fully constituted organisation. And I think now we're left with um, lots of questions about what happens in the longer term. Do those groups carry on? Do they disband? Um, do they become a formal recognised registered charity? There's, a, there's quite a lot of challenges for us in terms of providing in, infrastructure support to mutual aid groups uh, in the future. So my final slide then just is about uh, what we've learned over the last three months. I have to say coordination was hugely challenging. Uh, in Northern Ireland, we were not prepared. We, we, were, we um, don't have civil contingencies legislation in place and we just weren't ready for it. And um, 
there was such a deluge of people offering help at all levels um, that many people probably offered help and weren't really involved in the end because there were just so many. The community response massively outstripped the government government response and was on the ground so quickly, uh, often when government was just still thinking about how to do it. Um, and, and I think we are now beginning to reflect to learn the lessons and thinking about rebuilding for future waves because um, we know that we need to be much more prepared for next time round um, and, and that's certainly the process that we're in at the moment. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. There's some contact information there and please feel free to follow up directly by email with questions if you have them or in the Q&A at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. Really appreciate that. And the questions are flowing in, so I'm I'm pleased. Um, please continue to do that. Um, we're taking note of those, and we will certainly um, follow up and and ask those questions um, following Sarah's presentation. So, Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you um, to share your perspective. Thank you very much um, and thank you to everybody um, for joining us today. It's um, it's fantastic um, to be with you all. Um, so uh, I am uh, VSO's uh, resilience uh, advisor um, and have been uh, working the last couple of years across um, a lot of our Africa countries. And so I'm going to share a little bit about our experience. Um, as May mentioned earlier, it's not just about our experience in, in crisis, but how the work that we do um, in preparedness and in building resilience has really um, enabled our volunteers to be able to respond in this crisis. Um, so in my next slide, just to give you a little bit of um, an introduction to uh, VSO, um, we are a, um, a develop an international development charity um, working uh, more broadly in addressing uh, marginalization and poverty, um, trying to create you know, a fairer world um, for everybody. And we do that through um, volunteers, bringing together skills, backgrounds and experience, um, looking at um, achieving sustainable development. And uh, moving forward in the next slide, um, our volunteers generally um, live and work in the poorest communities. Um, they're based there alongside uh, the communities they work with, uh, working alongside people from those communities um, to develop new and creative ideas, to um, to solve poverty, to build the confidence and ability of communities to take ownership of change and to reach out to the most remote and excluded people. Uh, and we continue to um, live those values as we are uh, moving into COVID response, um, although um, adapting our approach um, to be safe in doing so. And my next slide just shows you a little bit about where our, our volunteers generally come from. So um, our volunteers don't all come from uh, Europe and the US, Australia. Um, we have volunteers coming from across um, across the globe. Uh, many of our volunteers that I have worked with, um, for example, volunteers in Rwanda who've come from Uganda, um, but the majority of our volunteers um, are based um, in their home countries. And so we really do have a lot of um, great uh, experience and knowledge um, in those country offices that those volunteers bring to work alongside people from, um, from different backgrounds um, and experience. So I just want to sort of draw attention to one um, and then my next slide, the sort of global standards for volunteering. And this sort of governs um, or is a, a, a piece of work, a voluntary standard um, that's uh, looking at the ways in which um, we uh, use volunteers in development work. Um, it's a resource for organisations involving volunteers in development. Um, and it, these principles apply um, in emergency response as much as they do um, in our day-to-day -day work. I'm not going to go through this in any detail because there was an entire seminar on this last week. Um, so I would urge you to go and have a look um, at that and look at that information in more detail. But a lot of the things um, that Denise has just been talking about around duty of care, how we manage volunteers um, really apply. But also one of the key points for us is about designing and delivering projects which involve um, our volunteers and our primary actors. And we use the term primary actors um, instead of beneficiaries. So the people who um, are affected by our projects should be at the heart of, uh, at the heart of those designing and developing them. Uh, and that is really important um, part for us. So moving on to the next slide. Um, just to carry on giving an overview of how we work. Um, 
the way that we work um, in VSO is what we call through our relational model. Um, and so we will work with community, national and international volunteers. Um, and when we're looking at our resilience work, um, we are trying to support um, the building of resilience, not just during or after emergency beforehand, to try and prevent communities ending up uh, experiencing a disaster, um, but also then supporting them through disaster response and recovery. And one of the ways in which we're doing that is that a lot of our volunteers are already based inside um, the services which communities are dependent upon. So they're based in schools and health centres and um, working in livelihoods areas. So I just skipped the next slide, which shows you a very quick um, different ways in which um, our volunteer uh, relational model uh, helps to ensure that um, we have a really um, uh, how, this, how our relational model works uh, and improves um, our programs and the way that we work with communities. And I can come back to that if it's um, of interest. But our approach in VSO, we work in, um, we look at um, health, um, education and livelihoods programs. And what that looks like in our next slide, in my next slide for our resilience um, framework, and apologies, it's a bit small, um, but essentially we look at um, mainstreaming resilience into education, into health, into livelihoods projects. Um, so what does that mean? Um, that means that we'll work with communities and institutions. So um, that might be with schools, um, with health centres, to look at developing risk assessments, um, to know, understand what their risks are, um, why are they vulnerable, um, and also what are their coping mechanisms, what are their capacities. We know that um, communities and services have um, coping mechanisms that they've developed over uh, lots of experience, and so how can we then help to support them um, to build that. Another key aspect of um, what we do is help them to develop uh, an action plan for how they can um, improve their resilience and how they can be prepared um, for particular hazards which may impact them and then we can support with, um, with implementation. But down at the bottom one of the key things that we also look at is our organisational um, preparedness. So um, across VSO we've got um, 24 countries in which we work um, and each of those countries has its own country office team. Uh, we've got very much a dispersed leadership approach. So those country offices have um, a lot of autonomy in the way that they work. Um, and one of the things that I've been working on over the last two years has been um, supporting those country offices to develop their own organisational preparedness plans. So thinking through how would they respond to an emergency, uh, what kind of hazards they might face uh, and how they might support their primary actors um, in responding. And that has involved looking at duty of care, safeguarding, um, for volunteers whenever they respond um, and also for making sure we're meeting the needs um, of our primary actors. So what I'm going to do now is very quickly, because I know we're quite short on time, um, I'm happy to go back to any of this as we um, get into the question and answer, it's just to show you some of the things that we've been doing um, and what that looks like, share some of my photographs um, uh, of work, experience working with our country um, office teams. So I mentioned these school preparedness plans and my first picture is showing you uh, one of our fabulous volunteers um, on the left hand side of the picture um, who had helped this school to do a school preparedness plan in Tanzania. Uh, one of the items they uh, identified as a challenge was that they had no hand washing stations so there was a risk of disease outbreaks and so we had provided, uh, we were able to work with them to provide um, hand washing stations um, so they could reduce their risk um, of disease and obviously that has helped as we go into COVID that has been a, a really important intervention to um, prevent the spread um of disease and just to um to say in advance a lot of these pictures were taken before covid um so um they aren't observing social distancing at this stage because what wasn't something we were concerned about um my next picture um is an introduction to my uh, our work in sierra leone and in sierra leone um following um, uh, the mudslide that happened there um in 2017 we trained up 75 community volunteers in disaster risk reduction uh working with the government disaster management agency uh, one of the things that we did was we formed, um, we trained up these community volunteers in um, resilience, but also in um, disaster response um, work. And so most of the time they're involved in um, supporting their communities to do risk assessments and develop preparedness plans and do inter implement interventions. So this picture here is the children um, in the disaster risk reduction club learning about the hazards um, that might affect them and how to stay safe. A particular challenge um, in Sierra Leone being um, flooding. 
Um, and we supported um, Sierra Leone as an organization to develop a preparedness plan and carried out an exercise for that. So they thought through what they would need to do and how they might adapt their normal volunteer management procedures in an emergency. So my next slide shows what happened whenever we actually did have um, an incident in Sierra Leone. Um, we had a, in 2019, there was a flood um, in August. Um, and we, these community volunteers who had been around for two years um, doing work in their communities were there on the front line um, as the floods um, swept through Freetown and they were supporting the evacuations. Um, as an organization, we were able to put in place our um, organizational preparedness plans. Um, we reviewed those, we carried out our risk assessments, uh, as Denise had spoken about earlier, identifying any safeguarding challenges, duty of care needs, um, recognizing that our volunteers were gonna be working quite long hours, um, the support needs that they would have, working in the field quite far out of, um, perhaps out of mobile phone signal, how we would maintain communication, um, identifying that they were, it was still raining, uh, the rain was still coming down, so provision of our boots and coats, um, really important to make sure that our volunteers were staying safe um, and um, able to, to do the great work that they were doing. And the sorts of things that our volunteers were then involved with, we were deployed to support with the, um, this picture here, collecting the data uh, of those who were affected um, by the flooding. Um, and it's fantastic to have, here we have a picture of one of our national volunteers on the right, working with our community volunteers. Our community volunteers, because they had been in these communities doing preparedness work, they knew the people, they spoke the language, they understood the culture. And so they were really able to make sure that the data we were collecting was accurate and that it met the needs um, of the people we were talking to. The next slide shows how they then supported us as we moved through our response work. Once we had the data, it was identified that there was a need for some um, response activities, and this is um, doing cash-based response. Um, so here we have our community volunteers really leading that process, um, part of the registration process um, as people are coming into our uh, distribution centre, making sure we've got the right people uh, that we uh, and that we are then accountable at the end. My colleague in the picture on the right, making sure that we've um, taken feedback and ensured the process is working um, for the community. And they're able to do that because of the trust and relationship that they have um, um, with the community and obviously as an organization supporting them through technical support and also the um, uh, the provision of um, the sort of necessary uh, items they needed so phone credit transport food um, all the things they needed to be able to deliver the response um, and so very quickly because I know I'm running out of time um, just to talk about what that now looks like in um, the COVID-19 scenario so my next slide is a picture of um, my colleagues in Sierra Leone. They were having some refresher training in March, just as we started to hear um, lockdowns were happening on COVID. And so um, they were able to incorporate into the training um, some information on COVID-19 and making sure that we started sharing those really key messages. As an organization, um, the vast majority of our volunteers have remained um, in placement. So our community volunteers are obviously based in their community, so they are still there um, during COVID. 75% um, of our national volunteers and almost 50% of our international volunteers have all continued in placement. Um, so those who wanted to return home were able to do so, uh, check their internationals, um, but others have stayed um, in country and are working remotely. Um, my next slide shows um, some of the ways um, our volunteers have been involved in the response. So our Sierra Leone volunteers, again, who have the trust and knowledge of their communities have been um, adapting and sharing messages um, with their communities in ways that um, they're able to understand. Um, and we've been able to maintain the support remotely to those volunteers, making sure they're provided with uh, the right kind of information that we're continuing to risk assess um, their involvement in these communities and making sure they've got the support that they need. Uh, my next slide shows some of my colleagues in Tanzania, um, where we've got our youth volunteers have been doing um, work with our um, Bajaj, tuk-tuk drivers uh, on maintaining um, safety during COVID-19. Uh, but we've also been working at adapting our programs. And so um, our livelihoods um, advisors have been uh, changing, supporting training for local small businesses on producing soap and sanitizer, uh, which they're then able to sell uh, to local people at fair prices. Uh, and often also with masks. Again, we've been adapting that process, working in coordination with other partners. Um, to make sure that we're doing it safely and that we're promoting safe practices. Uh, my next picture 
Uh, next slide is a picture of uh, one of my colleagues in Rwanda. Again, we've been adapting our work so volunteers are, uh, where they can't go into communities, um, able to provide things like maths and English lessons um, via radio, um, which is um, really, really important. And then finally, just a you know a shot of what does it look for some of our international volunteers? They might not be able to be um, in country for um, whatever uh, reason that might be. They may have had to return home, uh, but we still have more than 40 international volunteers working remotely um, during COVID. So there, um, this is one of our social cohesion advisors who was based in Myanmar. She's returned to the UK, um, but she's still supporting the team in Myanmar um, over Skype and email. Um, and sharing her expertise and helping them to develop training and resources. So again, we're as an organization now looking at um, how we adapt our support processes to provide support to volunteers um, on a more remote basis, particularly those who are now based back in uh, what are normally our volunteer sending um, countries. So that was a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, and um, if there are questions, obviously very happy to um, answer or go into more detail on any of that. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and let's go into our Q&A uh, session now. Uh, we had a great question um, about, you know, times of crisis. It's it's unexpected. Um, I think there are some of these um, where you can anticipate something's coming or, you know, uh, there could be flooding or the hurricane or something. But in this case, um, with COVID-19 and all, it was really, you know, we didn't know um, what, what the implications would be. And we were all impacted. And in a sense, uh, volunteers were impacted. The way we needed to manage ourselves was, was impacted. And in some cases, our, our, our colleague here has asked a question about, you know, our, even the employees um, may have been furloughed or may have been required to, um, you know, stay at home or unable to work. Um, and so how, how are people handling, you know, this period of transition? Um, I know for us with United Way Worldwide, you know, we saw things, um, you know, our offices um, still remain closed um, and we began to transition to virtual opportunities, but that does take time. And I think some of that um, was benefited by having relationships in advance, you know, doing some of these things um, or knowing some pieces of it or elements of what could be done in advance. But I wonder, Denise, if you could share a bit of, you know, what, what did you see happen, um, you know, that bridged that time from when, you know, things began to when you sort of had a handle on things. I know you talked about the mutual aid groups and the community response being so great, even before the government and others were prepared to do something. Could you say a bit more about that? Yeah, yeah happy to, May. I think, I, I suppose we did have um, a very quick community response, you know, lots of groups, football clubs, churches, um, all sorts of different organisations in Northern Ireland. We had uh, plenty of Orange Order groups, bands, all sorts of different groups. And then lots of um, street level, uh, you know, WhatsApp groups and things being set up just to manage to, you know, get shopping for people. The difficulty with, with that for us, I think, was because there wasn't a really clear structure in place in advance for that, um, what you then tended to find is that um, there, was, there was overlap and I suppose my my impression looking back on those first few days at the end of March was just a feeling of complete chaos, if I'm honest. And there was there was no clear community um, community structure in place. And I do think probably there was a great deal of activity, but probably sometimes a little bit more heat than light um, in, in hindsight. Um, Having said that, I think then we did see structures starting to emerge. And I mean, I definitely feel that had some of those structures been in place early on, uh, things would have you know, happened more quickly and people probably would have had their needs met more quickly um, uh, and probably more effectively. But I think still in all, there was such goodwill and people did their very best in a difficult situation. So I'd, I'd, it's very hard to be overly critical of that i think probably what we're trying to do now is kind of position that for the you know potential what happens next and to try and have those structures ready to stand up really quickly if if we need them again i think at an organizational level um it was a stretch for staff we were fortunate we had really good um agile working pro uh, processes and stuff in place but um you know even just the very basics it took a few days at least um for us to kind of get our find our feet in that really virtual environment um 
and and uh, and now you know the big question is do do you undo all of that and start to go back into an office based environment or do you just wait and see what happens and i think organizations are still hedging their bets certainly locally um i don't think people are moving too fast in that space Great. Thanks, Denise. I, I mean, I think that's really interesting, the transition from, you know, the immediate response to now recovery. Um, and we're even saying, you know, that people are really doing a lot of reimagining. Um, um, some of the services that we offered uh, that became virtual or valet, um, and where people were doing sort of a mixture of things, um, we had to reach new groups of volunteers. I mean, a, a completely different demographic yeah. of people. Um, and I, I think it's, just, it's broad and Excuse me. Sorry, just yes, yeah, just to say, interestingly, we had explored, for example, telephone befriending. We had had a conversation with our, our local health service less than three months ago to say, could we expand into that to manage waiting lists? And oh, no, no, we don't want that because it's not as good quality. But interestingly, we have really seen it come up into its own and it's become a lifeline for so many people over the last number of months so i think some of the services will not go back completely to where they were before i think things have changed utterly um uh, in in relation to some of that yeah i think it's going to be a challenge um i think for for those of us where i, I think the demand will be for it to be maybe a combination that will continue to see some in person but also um, uh, virtual or remote opportunities as well. We have a question from our colleague in India that talks about the challenges of the physical distancing, social distancing, that people aren't adhering to that, or it just really is a difficult thing to do. Um, and so, Sarah, I wonder if you can share a bit uh, or give suggestions on what um, you've seen or what you know is happening in places where that really has been a challenge. Um, yes, I think it is a it's a real challenge, and we're seeing different things in different countries. Um, but a lot of the places where we work um, uh, are places where, for example, the, the slum communities in Freetown in Sierra Leone, where um, there isn't two meters between houses, never mind two meters distance between people in the same house, um, uh, and people are having to go to work because um, they are taking part in subsistence work. So it's been um, a real challenge. What we find um, has been really um, successful, certainly my Sierra Leone colleagues, uh, who I talk about a lot because they've been doing, um, they, they share a lot of information with me since I've been there. Um, they've, um, the fact that they are part of the community, a lot of our community volunteers are, they, they know their community, they're part of it. They're able to adapt the messaging that's coming from government. Um, they're able to turn it into, um, you know, real messaging that works for, um, the community that they're based in um, and we've seen a lot of that we've seen um, tailors in Tanzania adapting to to masks because we know people can't stay um, necessarily stay at home or maintain that social distancing so if the masks are going to be able to help them to safely go um, go out whenever they need to we need to, be able to provide those at a cost that works and in a way which is not affecting uh, the medical supplies um, that are needed um, obviously in the hospitals. Um, so I think for us, it's been a lot about that, that trust basis. Um, a lot of our youth volunteers have been involved in this, adapting messages to reach out to youth audiences, both via social media um, and also in person. Uh, and they've got those relationships, they've built them up um, and they know how to talk to, to young people in their communities in the right way. So I think it's been, um, so the role that our community and national and youth volunteers have played um, has really meant that those relationships that we've spent time building um, in, you know, peace, what we call peace times, um, have really helped whenever we've gotten into the crisis element um, of this uh, pandemic. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question, um, and maybe um, if our panelists uh, don't have a, an answer for it, maybe there's a, someone else um, that does, and you can uh, share that with us in the, in the chat box. But a question around, um, for those communities where internet, um, uh, either the access or challenges with the speed um, um, with it as a problem, are there ways that people are communicating through um, any particular messaging app um, that's being used? Are there any suggestions that uh, folks have for that? Um, I'm happy to come in on that if that's um, sure. 
that's helpful. Um, so we're really aware of this. One of our one of the ways that we work is to try and work with the most um, the most marginalised, the hardest to reach. Um, and often that means that um, some of the great ideas that we have and um, initiatives that we see in terms of reaching out via internet um, aren't going to reach um, those most in need. So um, we haven't got a particular um, messaging app, although we are working on um, a number of, of possibilities around um, sort of text messaging. Um, but a lot of what we've been doing is getting out there. We saw we saw my pictures of the, the team in Sierra Leone with their megaphones. Um, our volunteers in Rwanda talking on the radio and reading out um, school messages um, and school lessons um, via radio because we know that that radio reach is uh, much broader than internet reach. Um, you know, tr those sorts of ways of working um, have been what we've been looking at. But I'd you know be really interested to hear if anybody else um, has other ways they've been doing it. Thanks, Sarah. And we'll we'll uh, keep looking to see. I haven't seen a response yet on that front, but we'll we'll look for that as well. Um, another uh, question for you, Denise. Um, it's it's about you had mentioned uh, the insurance um, and the importance of having this um, insurance to cover volunteers um, for those that in, are engaged with your organization. Um, so one is that cover all volunteers um, that are with your organization, and what about other volunteers that just go off and do um, something on their own? Is there something they need to be thinking about um, if they're not connected or um, you know, maybe it's through one of the mutual aid groups or something like that? How should they be thinking about this? Yeah, so for our, in our context, yes, we have insurance cover for all of the volunteers that we deploy. Um, and so that means that our insurer is aware of the roles that we're deploying into and the kinds of risk assessments. And um, that was all part of the negotiation in relation to, to this and indeed to other events and things that we've done in the past. Um, so, yes, and I would say, you know, uh, the reality is that if you are volunteering for a mutual aid organisation, the the probability is that there is no insurance cover uh, in place there and so therefore in a way I think it's kind of everybody for themselves and you have to recognize that that's the case um, and maybe that's absolutely fine if everybody knows that and everybody's clear about that from the beginning um, I think I think where it becomes difficult and more problematic is as, as those organizations really grow and um, you know, we do live, I mean, I, I, you know, Northern Ireland isn't isn't very different from other countries. In some ways, we live in a very litigious society where people are up to sue and up to, to blame if something goes wrong. And I suppose my slight concern is that, um, you know, some of the mutual aid groups have really established out of real goodwill. And it's, it's fantastic to see that. But I do worry a little bit that there isn't a real thought out approach to things like insurance and governance and safeguarding. And so therefore people might be um, putting themselves and others at risk without really realizing it. And I suppose as time goes on, that's one of the things that we really need to look at now in this kind of maybe slight um, lull uh, potentially before any kind of second wave or whatever is really just, you know, just make sure. And that's what I was saying about the infrastructure support to really encourage those organizations maybe to come under the umbrella of another organization or make sure they're partnering with somebody else who can help them with those kinds of things because that is it is important. Great, that's very helpful. Um, and Sarah, I have a question for you. Um, you know, I, you talked a bit about some of the virtual um, ways that um, your volunteers were, or international volunteers were um, helping out during the past few months during uh, the pandemic and all. Um, are there some other things um, uh, uh, that volunteers are doing right now um, that you could speak to? Like what are some other things specifically as it's related to COVID-19 that volunteers are engaged with? Oh, our volunteers are um, involved in um, huge numbers of <laughs> huge numbers of things um, while they're, um, you know, at the minute because um, our countries, you know, we work 24 countries. We've got different um, lockdown measures in each country. Um, so there are different things that we are able to do um, in each country as we go forward. So um, I guess sort of talked a little bit about um, some of the work that we've been we've been doing. In some countries like Tanzania, we can still run training, um, provided our numbers are small enough and we can maintain social distancing. Um, so training, providing alternative livelihoods training to um, uh, to small uh, medium enterprises has um, been something that we have been able um, to do and take forward. 
Um, similarly, colleagues in, in Mozambique have been supporting, providing similar training in prisons. So we're looking at um, some of the most vulnerable um, places and supporting prisoners with the materials and the training to develop, to um, get their own masks um, so that they're able to provide that. Um, and some of that is supported by international volunteers, um, some of it's supported by national volunteers and staff. Uh, it really is a mix uh, across the organization. And what we're looking at now as we look at all this, um, these different ways of working is how we can continue that. So at the minute we've got, uh, we're looking at uh, recruiting, for example, e-volunteers who can provide psychosocial support uh, as part of our education project. Um, and, um, you know, so those, those sorts of things um, are, are going on. We've also got volunteers supporting us um, at more strategic levels. So looking at um, helping us to design what our programs and projects might look like um, as we start. Uh, you know, you mentioned going into recovery. Um, not sure whether we're going there in every country, but as we look at the sort of longer term um, work that we'll be doing, supporting us in uh, identifying how we can best use our skills and expertise um, and our sort of our volunteering approach to, to meet the needs of our primary actors going forward. Great. Great. Um, I wonder, um, Denise, if you have had any um, experience with folks being volunteers being pressured, um, or uh, I guess pressured is the best word, to return to work that they've been doing uh, previously, um, um, but they're still unable to because of either the age restrictions or they're in a, a, a sensitive um, health risk um have there been examples of that or how has that been addressed if, if you've seen that in any way yes so just to clarify may are you asking me about uh, return to volunteering or return right. to take right return yes. to volunteering okay. yeah that's a that's a hot topic at the moment actually it's very interesting you asked that so we have seen a couple of different things starting to emerge so we, we've seen an and I think that across the UK, there's a great concern about numbers of older volunteers not returning to volunteering because of health concerns. So in Northern Ireland, for example, 25% of our volunteering population is over 65. And it's very clear looking at the data coming out about the people who are most affected by COVID-19 that there are very significant risks for the um, over 70s. Even if in all um, other ways you are, are fit and healthy, you may not know about an underlying health condition that would potentially make you vulnerable. So we are at the moment just navigating through this space. And I think it's very, um, it's difficult for organizations to make clear decisions. I mean, I think our guidance at the moment says that people can volunteer in a socially distanced way for, for the essential things that people people need, but they have to um, reflect on the fact that there is a higher risk for over 70s. We're also seeing insurance companies saying that they won't provide cover for over 70s, or they'll do it on an individually risk assessed basis. Um, and yet we have on the other side of things, volunteers desperate to return to volunteering because they love it and it's a big part of their social life and they don't want to be cut off from the wider community. So it's a really difficult line that organisations are, are walking. We don't have, I think, to be honest, we don't have clear answers at the moment. We're waiting for very clear guidance around the specific, around the age group. Um, I think that will emerge in the next week or so in terms of the Northern Ireland context. But I, I, do, I do think it's a really difficult one. And one of the things I'm very conscious of is that you know, we don't want to add to the problems of loneliness and social isolation mm -hmm. by saying that volunteers over 70 can't come come out again. Um, so, but you still have to have to manage the risk. We, I am heartened though organizations are being so creative in how they're keeping in touch with their volunteers and how they're looking for other ways of involving people who have been faithful volunteers for many years. So, so there's lots of really good and encouraging things happening in this space, but it isn't an easy or clear situation now. Right. Well, we, we're winding down. I want to do one last question um, very quickly, um, and it's around uh, the virtual, um, you know, growth of folks engaging in volunteering that way. And are there any qu a quick recommendation or suggestion that you have, Denise, around um, interactions with children and how to protect from cyberbullying, child grooming, any other types of, of things that would, might put them at risk? Uh, I actually think that's really difficult and what we've done is just simply ask uh, for children to be uh, online with their parents in the room. That, that's just simply how we've managed it because it's it's very difficult to, to do anything other than that. 
And I, the only thing I would add to that is we've done things where it goes through an intermediary. So it isn't, um, there may be assistance with things, but um, it goes through the teacher or through um, a, another organization for that. We didn't get to all of the questions. There, are, there were a lot there, but just to close this out, um, Denise, if you had one piece of advice to give everyone, what would that be? And then Sarah, I'll ask you the same. This is mine would be have a, a good clear plan and a structure in place, but don't be afraid to think on your feet as well, because, um, but, but I suppose keeping your values at the core of everything you do. Awesome, and Sarah? I would say um, make sure you're looking after yourself and your volunteers. Um, this is not going to be a, um, a short term um, issue that we're dealing with. COVID-19 is going to be with us for a while and we're going to continue to have all of our other sort of business as usual challenges, um, disasters and emergencies you respond to. So making sure that you're looking after yourselves and your volunteers so you're able to give your best, um, I think is really important. Awesome. And I close by saying I think it's it's great that we're having these types of webinars and that people are taking some time to really reflect um, and learn from each of our experiences um, so that we're better prepared um, um, the next time. So my thanks to our panelists and I'll turn it over uh, to Wendy to close this out. Thank you, May. And thank you to everyone this afternoon. I think we've had a, a wonderful webinar. And actually, the information expertise has come from three continents, North America, Europe and Africa. And I think it really does uh, show that we've all been facing a global crisis uh, through the pandemic. And I'm also heartened that good practice in a crisis. Uh, there are certainly lots of things that are common denominators. We've heard that. So please, I would encourage everyone to make use of going back to the COVID-19 website in terms of IAVI look at the resources that are there, look at the webinars, this webinar and the webinars we've had previously. There's a wealth of information there that is really helpful to people. Um, please keep engaged with IAVI, please keep engaged with us through this time and into the future and uh, join our network, um, become a global friend of volunteering. You may be one already, I'm sure you are, but please sign up for that as well. And I say, look again at our COVID-19 responses and our, our resources and response fund. Thank you very much. Thank you, May. You were an excellent moderator. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Sarah. You had so much to offer. Uh, the time really went fast. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>